Well, again, we're in the book of Revelation, and uh, this is exciting. I love, I love the book of Revelation. It's one of the first books I got into when I started reading my Bible, and I've and, uh, been in it ever since. Some, I don't know how many years, it's been uh, quite a while, probably 30 plus, 35 years. All right, well, we are in chapter 2, as you can see, and so we're going to continue. Uh, Jesus is uh, in the midst of the candlesticks, right? He's got the seven candlesticks, which are the seven churches, and we understand that these were literal churches during the time of John. These All seven of these churches existed in different parts of Asia Minor, which is today modern-day Turkey. And so we've already covered one church, and now we're going to get to the second church, all right? So uh, just a reminder, not only were they literal churches, but these represented what's going to happen to the church over the next 2,000 years. So we have what we call like the church age, which you know started back there uh, when, when the church was birthed, and it's been going for roughly 2,000 years. So each of these churches represents periods of time which were kind of a prophecy of what was going to happen to the church over the next 2,000 years. And so the the first church that was mentioned, of course, was Ephesians. And so these were put in this order on purpose because of they are, uh, again, a a time period or a, a period in which we can see what's going to happen and we can, if, and, and the more you, you know, understand church history, these things line up very much like these seven churches. So the first period of time was the Ephesians church, and that was what we call the apostolic church, which covered about 100 years. The second church that I'm covering tonight is the Smyrna church, which was over the next 200 years, which is the persecuted church. Uh, the third church, which I'll cover tonight, is the church of Pergamos, and that covered uh, 200 more years after that. It's the church of Constantine, or the marriage of church and state. Then we go on and on to, to the other sev- seven churches. So just so you guys are clear on that, uh, these churches represent all stages of the church throughout the last 2,000 years. Now, let's get into tonight. We're on uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna. Angel means, in the Greek, it's the word angelos, which just means messenger, which we believe, I believe personally, that he's, he's talking to the, to the pastor, the, the head of the church, the messenger to that church is the pastor. All right, to the angel or the pastor of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. The word Smyrna, the, the root word is myrrh, which is a type of fragrance. And this particular fragrance uh, you might be familiar with. Remember the, the three wise, well, not three wise men, the wise men brought these gifts to Jesus at his birth, one of them was myrrh. One of them was frankincense, one of them was gold, one of them was myrrh. The myrrh, when crushed, lets off this beautiful fragrance or aroma. And so it was a foreshadowing when he was born, he got myrrh as a gift. It was a foreshadowing of him being crushed one day. Okay. And so we know, of course, he was was tortured, beaten, and and, uh, put on a cross, crucified. And so it speaks of crushing. Well, the same is true with this particular church and this particular time period of the early church when the early church was persecuted severely, very severely, by the by the Roman government, okay, the the Caesars over over time. And so that's what uh, we're going to talk about as as we get get into this. So uh, again, this was a literal church, but it also represents a time where the church would be persecuted. You know, some people don't believe you know, the church will be persecuted. Some people believe, you know, if you have enough faith, like anything you want can happen. You don't have to suffer at all. You don't have to go through anything. But that's not what Jesus said. Just, Jesus said that uh, if, if, you're a, if you're a godly person, you will be persecuted, okay? It's, it's going to happen. Um, and, and so the church will go through persecution. And this is, of course, an example of that. This church was greatly persecuted over the, uh, this 200 year period of time. So, again, this is a message to the pastor of this church, and he is supposed to tell this 
saith he that is the first and the last. I, I like that, you know, we, we talk about, we have the, the epistles. We have the, the epistle to the Ephesians and to the Thessalonians and the Phil, Phil, uh, the, to Philemon and to um, Romans and to the Corinthians and so forth. These are all letters. Epistles just means letters. And we think that those are the only letters in the Bible, but here's seven additional letters, but these weren't written by Paul. These are signed by Jesus Christ himself. And so that's the way I look at these. These are, these are not just messages to, to the old church 2,000 years ago. These are messages to our church. So there's application that we need to understand and receive as we read these letters as well. There's something we need to get uh, from all, all seven of these letters as well. But these are by Jesus himself. He says he is the first and the last. And we would say the Alpha and Omega, as it's written in other places uh, in Revelation as well. Uh, of course, Jesus is the first, being the creator, and he is the last. He is, he is the one that consummates or brings all things to an end. So he puts all things into motion. He creates all things. And then he's the one that at the end judges and, and uh, brings all things back around. And we're looking for at the end of the final end of our age, where all the, the sin and death and wickedness and all these things will be cast aside and, and will enter into a new age with no sin, with a new heaven and a new earth. So he is the first and the last. He's the one that, that uh, makes all that happen. He was dead. You know, there are people today, Islam, for example, that don't believe Jesus ever died on the cross. So this is a refutation against that. It is very clear. Jesus himself said, I died. All right. He was dead. But of course, now he is alive. He is resurrected. Hallelujah. So it's clear that Jesus is the one speaking here. And he says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. All right? So let's, let's make it clear. Jesus knows your works. Jesus is examining your works all the time. All the things you do uh, in his name or on his behalf, all the things you say you do on his behalf, and everything else as well. Okay? So we understand we're not saved by works. Works don't save us, but we are to be fruitful and producing good works. If you're a real Christian, you will be producing good works. They, good works don't save you. You don't do good, good works as, as an act of um, payment. Well, if I do this, God, you'll do this for me. No, that's not how it works. Uh, Jesus made the payment on the cross for us. Jesus alone saves, and your faith in him is what saves. But because we're saved, we will do good works. That is the evidence that there has been a true transformation in our life is that we will live more godly and be more like Jesus, okay? And so we, we will all stand at, before God at the Bema seat. Now, the, the Bema seat just means a, a raised pedestal. And that, that means that uh, we're not going to be judged for sin. Even Christians will stand before God, before Jesus. We're not going to be judged for sin, for sin was dealt with on the cross. But we still will be judged for the things that we did in our lifetime, uh, whether good or evil. Everything that was um, unproductive, unfruitful, will be burned up in the fire. It is of no value. There is no reward. But those things that you did in obedience to God, the things you did by the Spirit of God, uh, out of love, those things that were of God that you did, those are the things that you get reward for. So Jesus is always examining our works. He knows of our tribulation. He knows what you're going through. He knows your trouble, and he says he knows of their poverty. They were in uh, deep poverty, but it says he declares you are rich. You see, these, this is the church that is being crushed, right? This is the church that, that is giving off a beautiful scent, a beautiful fragrance and aroma up before God because they're going through all these things. These, this is one of two churches that had no criticism by Jesus, okay? This was, this is all, if it was a report card, you got straight A's, all right? Jesus only has good things to say about this church, but they're going through, man. They have poverty. They have, they're being crushed. They're, they're, they're being persecuted, and even from within, there are um, false people, false doctrine, false teachers that are trying to de destroy this church from within, 
And that's what he talks about here. But it is interesting that they think that they're poor. But he says, you are rich. There's another place, another church later on, the last church, the Laodicean church, that they think they are rich. But Jesus declares, you are poor, you are miserable, you are blind, you are naked. So those people that, that run around boasting of how great they are, their riches are and how, how they have this and how they have that, they are spiritually blind. Don't listen to them, okay? <laughs> These are the people that Jesus lifts up and says nothing bad about because they're being crushed. I, and then it talks about, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, all right? And what this is really talking about is those that claim to be believers in the church. What was it talking about? Well, in uh, Romans 2.28, it says, he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, okay? It's just not because of your, your bloodline, your heritage, because you're the seed of Abraham through genetics. He's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, where there's a circumcision, is that, is that of the heart and the spirit and not the letter, whose praise is not of men, but, from, but of God. So we are all, spiritually speaking, Jews. If you're in the body of Christ, where your heart has been changed, where you have made Jesus Savior and Lord of your life, where he, he is the one that directs and dictates and guides your life, and you say, yes, Lord, I'll obey you. There's a circumcision, a cutting away of the flesh, because the heart yearns to do the will of your Father. And so these are the spiritual Jews. These are the the true Jews, you could say. But don't get this uh, misunderstood, because this is a terrible doctrine that's gone, gone out called replacement theology, which says the church has replaced the Jews. That God has cast aside the Jewish people, they are cursed, and, and the church is, is all there is. But that's not true. According to the Bible, you know, looking at Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, God still has an awesome, wonderful plan for the Jewish people, the Jewish nation and the Jewish heritage, the, the people that are of the flesh, Jewish. He, he talks about in Ezekiel 37, that the dry bones will rise. That's talking about the Jewish people. There's salvation and revival coming to Jewish people, the Jewish people, because they will one day, not all of them, but a remnant of them, a remnant, will receive their Messiah and see that Jesus Christ was the one that was truly their Messiah all along. So that, uh, don't don't ever uh, think that God has cast aside the Jewish people. He has not. And that's, unfortunately, the the source of much anti-Semitism today is replacement theology, which came from bad teaching within the church. So, but this is talking about spiritual Jews and that these people that claim to be Christians, in other words, they, they, this church recognized them and Jesus recognized them and called them, uh, that they were committing blasphemy because they were, um, of spreading false doctrines in the church. And he calls these people in the church the synagogue of Satan. And I get that. <laughs> what, if, what if, you know, some, some pastor, and this was a message to a pastor to tell the church, you're of the synagogue of Satan. Oh, that, that's not loving, pastor. How could you dare say that? Calling people in the church of the synagogue of Satan. That's not Christ-like. Well, Jesus is the one that said it. You know, but we, we don't see that. We don't see uh, any type of reprimand or criticism when Satan enters into the church. There's nobody that, that is going to deal, the pastors generally don't deal with that. And so they, they have all kinds of chaos within their church and Satan just wreaks havoc within the church. But Jesus himself, uh, oh, that's just not loving. But Jesus himself said, these are of the synagogue of Satan. So he hated what was happening uh, by these people that were blaspheming and bringing false doctrines into the, church, into the church. So he says in the next verse, verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. All right? Fear not. What a wonderful thing. Because we have to see things spiritually. We have to hold fast until the end. Fear none of those things 
which thou shalt suffer. Well, I mean, naturally, if Jesus himself is telling you you're going to suffer, it's going to happen. The words of Jesus never fail, so this is bad news. But then he says, fear not. Hallelujah. Why? He is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Fear, none of those things. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Now, just think, what if some person who, who comes up to you and gives a, a prophecy to you and says, you're going un, into prison. You're going to prison. Well, I don't accept that prophecy. I, uh-uh, that's, that's of the devil. I don't want to hear that. You know, that's the way people are today. It always has to be a, a positive prophecy. But, uh, you know, there were some negative prophecies. There, there were some bad things. And uh, what if he went and, and said, you shall have tribulation 10 days, be thou faithful unto death. What? I'm going to prison and then unto death? I don't accept that prophecy. <laughs> That's of the devil, right? No, no. All prophecy is not positive, okay? But the, the main point is you have to see things spiritually. He said, fear not. Fear not. You will go through some suffering. You're, you're, the, the church will go through suffering. People today don't believe the church is going to go through any suffering. That's not true. That's not biblical, okay? Uh, the true church will go through suffering and persecution. It's not from God. It's from the devil. Notice, it's the devil that's going to cast them into prison. Not God. The devil is after you. But God is greater. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world, right? The devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation. Tribulation, that means trouble, problems. 10 days. Now, this was literally, I believe, uh, applicable to that church, the, the church of Smyrna during, during their lifetime. But if we're looking again at the symbolic period of time, the second period of time uh, from about, what was it, 100 to 300, um, that was the time of great persecution of the early church. And the 10 days can be representative of 10 periods of time. And so from uh, Chuck Mishler, he wrote a book about the seven letters to the seven churches. He said the seven periods of time were marked by seven Caesars, which came against the early church. The first Caesar was Claudius uh, from 41 to 54. Then there was Nero from 54 to 68. Uh, and I'm not going to say all the time periods. There, there was the third Caesar was Domitian, there was Trajan, there was Marcus Aurelius, there was Septimius Cerverus, there was Maximus Thrax, there was Decius Valerian, and then uh, Diocletian. Okay, so th those were 10 Caesars for 200 years that severely persecuted the church. You heard, of course, of, of the Christians thrown to the lions and the Christians that were, you know, lit on fire and the Christians that were blamed for uh, burning Rome when it was really Nero fiddling on the roof and all these things. And so these were 10 periods of time that the early church had to deal uh, with persecution, severe persecution. And what does Jesus say? He says unto them, be thou faithful unto death. That's what Jesus requires. Be thou faithful unto death. Can we be faithful even unto persecution? See, the true church, I believe, can. When the true, true church was persecuted, they actually became stronger in their faith and spread their faith farther. They went all throughout the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, spreading their faith, not shutting their mouths. And the false church, well, uh, they ain't going to stand for persecution. You know, the hypocrites in the false church, you know, ran like rats off the Titanic, right? So the true church really shows itself or proves itself during times of hard, hardship and persecution and the false church abandons ship. Verse 11, next verse. Oh, let me say, he also gives you, be faithful and I will give you the crown of life. And this is really for all who are faithful unto the end. You cannot abandon your faith. It is possible to abandon your faith, to turn your back on God and Jesus Christ and walk away and say, I, I don't want this anymore and lose your faith. I believe that. That's why he says you have to be faithful unto death. You have to be faithful all the way to the end. And the reward is the same for, I believe, all Christians. We all get the crown of life. So that's one of many rewards spoken of in our New Testament. All right, now verse 11, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So these letters were to the churches. 
And therefore, it's also unto us as a church, you know, almost 2,000 years later. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. In other words, we have to have a, a spiritual ear to understand what's being said here. We have to uh, make sure we don't just relegate that to something in the past, but always read your Bible and say, how does this apply to me? What can I get out of this? You know, one of the greatest things I can give you as, as you read your Bible is to always ask questions. What, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? And, and the Holy Spirit will answer you a lot of times right there. You know, always ask questions. Realize the author of the book is sitting right there as you read your Bible. Say, what does this mean, Lord? I don't understand this. And he will open to you the truths of his word. He will bring revelation. It might not be at that moment. It might be a week later, a month later, years later. Some stuff I didn't get till a decade later or more. You know, some things I'm not ready for. But as I learned and as I grew spiritually, God's always answering these questions. I don't believe he's one that's holding back truth, but he will hold it back until you're, you're ready for it. But this is talking about hearing things spiritually. You know, that's what it talks about in 1 Corinthians 2.12. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. Notice the spirit of God is speaking to the church. Jesus is speaking to the church. It's the same voice, the spirit of God. Uh, it says that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13 goes on to say, comparing, I'm, I'm reading out of 1 Corinthians 2.13, Comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. That's having an ear to hear that which is spiritual. Not looking at just the natural, but having an ear where there's revelation, where the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. That's one way we know we're a believer is, is we have the Spirit of God speaking to us, opening up the Scriptures. You know, when you're reading your Bible and, and a word just pops off the page and you highlight it or you underline it and, and you write some notes on, in your Bible, I encourage you to write in your Bible, you know, or you go write some notes down uh, somewhere else. I, always, I have an electronic Bible, so I, 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 mean, I got thousands of notes now for, for all these years, decades of studying the Bible in my electronic Bible. I'm always writing things, the Spirit of God is just giving me revelation. And, and this book, of, of, of all books, is one of those types of books that every time you read it, you're definitely going to get something out of it. Remember, the book of Revelation is the book, the only book in the whole Bible that pronounces a blessing just for reading it. So I love to read the book of Revelation. I love to, you know, hear what the Spirit of God is, is saying, and um, it's the way we grow, feeding on the Word of God. But we have to have a spiritual ear. So, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. We understand the second death is the ultimate death. It's the worst thing that can happen to a creation, to, to, to an angel or to a man or any other creation that God has made out there. There's coming a judgment day where all whose names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be thrown into a lake of fire, okay? That's not symbolic. That's a literal lake of fire. It's a horrible Horrible thing. The worst part is it's for eternity. There's no getting out. So that's why we want to make sure that we're right with God now, right? We want to always pr pronounce and proclaim the gospel message, giving people a chance to be saved, because this is the last chance you get. This is, this is the whole thing right here. You miss it now. You've, you've, you've missed everything. So uh, how do you overcome? Well, we read in another part. I think it's from Revelation as well. We overcome by our faith, our faith. Our faith in Christ Jesus, not our works, it's by our faith. And we could talk a lot about works, but I'm not going to open up that can of worms. It is by our faith that we overcome. I'm sorry, it's in 1 John chapter 5. For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God? You overcome the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So we understand this all started back in the Garden of Eden. And uh, second death was born. Second death mean, means eternal death, all right? There's, there's natural death where we, we die, where our spirit and soul is separated from our body. But then there's the eternal death that happens after the great white throne judgment at the end of this age. So uh, another thing to just mark before we get into the next um, church I'll read out of a, a commentary. It's interesting to me that the church of Smyrna was um, 
has persisted throughout the ages. Only the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia have enjoyed a continuous existence since the first century. And these are the two churches for whom Jesus offered no criticism. In other words, all these other churches where Jesus gave criticism, they were annihilated. They're gone. They don't exist. But Smyrna and Philadelphia are actual churches that lasted through the centuries. And these are the ones, again, that had no criticism, no failing grades on their report card. All right, next verse. Um, well, again, just a reminder, we've already covered the Ephesian church, and now we've covered the second period of time, talking about the persecuted church, the church of Smyrna. Now we're going to talk about the third period of time, from about 300 to 500 AD, the church of Pergamos. All right, this, again, this is representative of the, the stages, you could say, of the church over the last 2,000 years. So we're going to talk about Pergamos. Pergamos, uh, the word is um, really, you could break it up into two words. In the Greek, it's per and then gamos. Uh, per meaning, uh, I think, by, but the word gamos is the word marriage. So you could say it's by marriage. And so uh, theologians say this means it is, the church that has been married to something. Well, what's it been married to? Well, really, uh, primarily, it's the church that became married to the state. And so that's why we bring up the, the time of Constantine. You know, this it literally was the time of Constantine that began, began a whole um, age or period of time where the church and the state merged into one entity, and it was not good. It was probably the worst thing that has ever happened to the church. So we go from a period of constant persecution of the church, bloody persecution. You know, millions of Christians died over the first, over that period of time of about 200 years, all those, the 10 emperors that crushed the church. Uh, about 5 million Christians died during that time, it's estimated, which is a massive number if, you know, Five million doesn't sound like a lot today. We live on a planet with eight billion people. But 2,000 years ago, five million people is a massive, massive number, you know. And so five million Christians, estimated, died during that time. So you can imagine we go from a period of terrible persecution to now through Constantine. Constantine became a Christian. Um, now the persecution stopped which is like a huge relief, it would seem, but it actually was the worst thing that happened to the church, one of the worst things that ever could have happened to the church. And so I'll explain why um, as we go along here. But So there was a marriage, pergamos, the word gamos means marriage. So this is, it represents the church being married to the state, and also, I'll get to it a little later, church being married to paganism, which seems to go hand in hand. So I'll read a commentary. Emperor Constantine famously fought the Battle of Milvian Bridge, October of 312 AD. And he told a Christian historian, Eusebius, that he looked into the sky and saw a vision of a cross uh, emblazoned with the words, in this sign, conquer. Constantine painted the Christian symbol of the cross on his men's shields, and the next day he won the battle. And so he credited his victory to the Christian God and declared himself a Christian. Okay. Again, that's from Chuck Mishler's commentary. So there we go. And I, I, I honestly, people argue this. I don't think it's arguable at all. I don't think he was a Christian. I don't think that sign in the sky, who knows, it might have been some clouds. Who knows what it was? It wasn't from God. It wasn't from God. You know, the devil can do signs too, right? And so this, this was a great deception that, that um, had some good things that come out of it. But I don't believe uh, Constantine was a Christian at all. Because God never instructs Christians to go conquer people with swords, all right? That's, that's devilish. That's, we're called, we wrestle with, not with flesh and blood. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual. It's our fight is spiritual. He that has an ear, hear things spiritually. So uh, this sign in the sky 
was from the devil. And, but um, now the church can safely worship. And again, what happened was a marriage of state and church together so that Christianity, Christianity became the state religion. So now we have scores of all these pagans worshiping all these false gods and so forth that now have to become Christians. But it's not real Christianity, of course, because Christianity is never forced or coerced. Christianity has to be by free will. But they are, they, it's, it's just like so many that go to church today, you know, they go to church just out of some kind of duty or religion, but they had no relationship with God. And so the same kind of concept was, was this. These people would uh, call themselves Christian and even go to churches and do all the, the motions. But then when church was over, they go do their pagan religion on every hill, uh, worshiping all these false gods. So Constantine was, was it, it set the foundation for what came next. The next church is the Roman Catholic Church or the Papal Church. But this set the foundation of it. So, um, the, the, Constantine was a pagan, okay? So, this wasn't just um, state, which was the problem, but also paganism. So, there was a marriage of paganism and Christianity. And so, uh, Constantine was the guy that tried to take all the uh, pagan holidays and marry them with Christian holidays, to kind of cover them up and, and, and make them look good. Um, he, he, um, he, I mean, and, and the Roman Catholic Church just doubled down on that. They, they continued to do the same thing. You know, there, there was a theocracy, you could say, back in the Old Testament where Israel had both state and religion and the true and the living God. Um, but this was not a godly state. This was a pagan evil, wicked state trying to marry it to the church. It's what we call syncretism, where you try to bring together two diametric, diametrically opposed beliefs into one mind, one belief system, and you can't do it. You can't mix uh, paganism with Christianity. Obviously, they, they, the two don't go together. So that's, that's kind of set up of where we are. He says, unto the angel, again, talking to the pastor of the church at Pergamos, write, these things saith he which has the sharp sword with two edges. All right, uh, that's a warning. All right, that's a warning. The sword is coming. Jesus and the sword, the sword representing the word of God, which is going to judge them. Jesus said in, an, in another place, I'm not going to judge you. It's the word which I have spoken that is going to judge you. So he is warning them. There's a sword that is coming. There's judgment. Again, the church today doesn't like to hear that, that, that Jesus is the judge, that there is a wrath of the Lamb that is coming, that, that doesn't seem consistent with this loving Jesus. But Jesus is both a holy, righteous Jesus who's coming with wrath against his enemies, but he's also, he is a loving Jesus at the same time. But, you know, the church today only wants to look at one thing, only one side, and not bring any warning or any correction whatsoever. But we see here that, that Jesus is the one bringing the warning and the correction. He's coming with a two-edged sword. So again, Pergamos is the state church. Christianity became the state religion. So we could say it this way. What Satan had failed to do by persecuting the church, he tried to eliminate the church by just slaughtering Christians. It didn't work. He completely changed strategies. Now he went from trying to destroy the church to infiltrating the church through this pagan guy, Constantine. Marrying state and church together. Marrying uh, paganism and church together. So instead of trying to destroy from the outside, he was much more successful in destroying the church by being married to it from the inside. And so that's the tragedy of the, the Pergamos church. We have to understand, in the book of Genesis, God set up three institutions. He, he made marriage, or, or family, I should say, 
made family, he made church, and he made government. And these are institutions, we can go back and look at them in the book of Genesis, that these are the things that God created um, as institutions. But the problem is when they try to merge together, the problem is where maybe um, they try to dominate or control one another. And, and so there, there we see all kinds of evil throughout the history of man where church tried to control state or state tried to control church. There's all kinds of corruption um, where these institutions, I kind of visually think of, think of them as three circles, and they're supposed to stay separate. So there's been great evil and massacres and corruption that have happened over the last thousands of years because you know, state tried to control the church, or the church even tried to control the state. There's different instances of that. But there's also this great evil where two of them merge, where they're outside their boundaries, they're outside the authority that God has ordained for them. When church and state merge into one uh, uh, entity, and I, I personally believe that's similar to what's going to happen um, with the Antichrist and that false prophet, which we'll get into in the book of Revelation, where there's, there's going to be this kind of... Uh, entity of both religion that kind of brings uh, kind of validation to the, the state. That's why the false prophet is going to tell everybody to worship the Antichrist. He's validating that this guy is, is God, and he's going to be the head of a world government, this Antichrist character, uh, whoever he is. And so we see these things coming together, and this is where, uh, this is later we'll read, where Satan has his seat has uh, his, his throne. So, keep going. Verse 13, I know thy works. Again, Jesus is always examining our works. We don't want to get so much into thinking, well, it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, I'm saved and it doesn't matter what I do now. No, <laughs> we will stand before God for our works. I guess I should hit the button. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. Jesus knows us where you are. He knows where this church was. He dwelt, the, the Pergamus church lived, Pergamum was a place of Caesar worship. Caesar was God to these guys, uh, among many pagan gods as well, you know, all the Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and all these other uh, gods. But this is pl the place where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. So this is, in, I don't know, encouraging to me, because they're where Satan's seat is, yet they're holding fast, okay? He did have criticism for them, but he also had some, some A's on their report card. They held fast in the midst of this pagan, idolatrous, evil uh, city. And we could look at it at, at over the 200 years. They held fast uh, unto death. Thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith. He calls it my faith. I like that. He calls it my faith, Christianity, my faith. Even in those days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, my martyr, I like that too. He's called my martyr. If you're his, he, he's possessive of you. <laughs> you're his. My martyr, my faithful martyr. You know, I can't think of any other place in the Bible where Jesus um, uh, commends a person, you know, like this as a martyr, Antipas, who was slain among you where Satan dwells, okay? The, the word Antipas, by the way, one translation of his name means against everything, <laughs> against everything. You know, there's a story of an early church father and uh, he was being reprimanded, and, and, he's, and someone walked up to him and said, don't you know that uh, the whole world is against you? And so he replied, well, then I'm against the whole world. <laughs> Instead of backing down and compromising, we need to be that kind of church that doesn't compromise. The whole world is against us, so we just double down on preaching this word. We keep preaching the truth. We preach, keep holding fast until the end. We never compromise the word of God. And we see compromise everywhere today in this age. Compromising with the world where they're letting, you know, homosexuals into the pulpit and, and uh, trans people and homosexual marriage and all these things, trying to fit in with the world, trying to uh, uh, be tolerant is, is their word. That's compromise. 
Now, if the whole world is against us, then hold fast. We're not here to please them. We're here to please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's talk about this thing called Satan's seat. I have a picture of it, I think. If I can get it, go up. That's Satan's seat. That's actually Satan's, it's a replica of Satan's seat. That's, that's what it was called. It's also known as the altar of Zeus. And this is, a, it's, you can go, go to it today. It's uh, in Berlin. It's a museum that they made of Pergamos because they love Satan's seat or the altar of Zeus. That's how the world is. And so this is a real thing. It, it, it was, it was uh, called Satan's seat. And so from this thing, that's, I think they took the actual stuff and, and moved it to Berlin and just kind of re, you know, furbished it up and, and recreated it. Um, and and, they, and they, they love it. <laughs> they love, the world loves Satan's seat. The world, so this was also known as the altar of Zeus or the altar of Pergamon. And 24 hours a day, they would offer up animal scent, uh, incense to their pagan gods. And just nonsense, nonstop. And this is the, the smell of the, the, the animal incense would be throughout the city. And the Christians in Pergamon would have to, to deal with this. Um, let me read a little bit. Um, the, the Pergamum altar, or the altar of Zeus, is a well-preserved ancient structure that dated back to the Hellenistic period. It had space for around 10,000 people and was known for its steep design, reaching up to 36 meters. And so that's why uh, this is altar, the, the altar of Zeus. It's known as the seat of Satan. And so when Jesus is talking about, I, I know that you're, you're where Satan is, he was being literal, that's this, you know. Um, but the thing is, again, this, this is a symbol of what we're dealing with. We, we feel like, you know, Satan has such power in this, these final hours of this age. But the church can hold fast. If the church did it then, the church can do it now. They held fast in the midst of great paganism and wickedness all around them. If they did it then, we can do it now because, again, greater is he that is in us and he that is in this world. We can overcome uh, Satan. We have the authority to do so in the name of Jesus. We can overcome false doctrines and the teachers that are in the church as well. So, verse 14, but I have a few things against thee. Jesus now uh, has some things against them on their report card, some Fs, some failing grades. I have a few things against thee because thou hast there in the church, there, them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, all right, who told or who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So here we have uh, very plain idolatry. So there's, uh, if, you, if you know your, your Old Testament, Balaam was, uh, he's called a prophet in the Bible, but he wasn't a prophet of God by any means. Okay, he was just because he's called a prophet doesn't mean he was a prophet of God. They would also call pagan prophets prophets in the Bible, and he was the the ultimate pagan prophet. Okay, he lived during the time of Moses, and there is he was he was a wizard. He was a a witch or a sorcerer, a medium, a diviner, all these wicked things. He was like the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, during his time. Okay, that's who Balaam is called a prophet uh, in our Bible. And there's quite a bit written about him. And so um, this, if you know your Old Testament, oh, the word Balaam, if you look it up, means kinsman of the god Baal. Baal. So that's where we see his name, Balaam. Um, but he had great notoriety during his day. And so the story goes, Balak was a king and the king wanted to curse Israel. Israel was the enemy of this, this king Balak. And so he hires Balaam from, you know, 400 miles away to come. And he didn't want to come. So he says, I'm going to give you, give you all, like this huge mound of, of treasure. This huge. He goes, okay, I'll come. And so that's a doctrine of Balaam, by the way. They won't come unless they got some money. I might get to that a little bit more later. Talking about that in the church. They won't come unless they got the paycheck coming. Without the paycheck, they're not going to come. That's devilish. I might talk about that more later. But anyway, what happened to the story was uh, this, the king hires this guy. 
he's this sorcerer, witch, medium, diviner, evil guy, to curse Israel, the, the enemies of Balak and his, his people. Uh, I think it was the Midianites. Um, so Balak comes, and he believes, you know, in oracles, and he starts uh, saying, all right, we need to burn some, some offerings on this hill. And then he goes to a different hill, and then a different hill, and all these, I think it's seven hills, and he burns these. And then he finally hears that he cannot curse the people of God. He attempts to, but he's not able to do so. It, um, he was just not able to do it. God stopped him from cursing the people of Israel. So the story goes that, hey, I have an idea. I know how to curse God's people without cursing God's people. I can do it indirectly. I'll show you how to do it, King Balak. What you need to do, you see that temple over there with all your people worshiping at that temple? I need you to take all those women at that temple, get them to strip them clothes off, and come down here and dance in front of the Israelite men, and you'll get them. And so that's exactly what happened. And so the, the women came down, stripped their clothes off, danced in front of the Israelite men. They were instructed to take the men, bring them back up to the temple, and they would eat sacrifices, un eat, eat unto God, make sacrifices unto the false god Baal, and do other things I'm not going to talk about. Uh, and so these men were obviously unfaithful. And so that's the doctrine of Balaam, appealing to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, to bring people into uh, idolatry, spiritual idolatry, paganism, um, forsaking God. So uh, Balaam couldn't directly curse them, but indirectly he did by tempting them to sin. I mean, I mean, that's, I mean that's, that's Satan himself. You know, he can't like come and kill you. He'd love to if he could, but he can't do that. So what does he do is he tempts you to destroy yourself. And that's the doctrine of Balaam. If you can just get them to sin, they will destroy themselves. They will bring a curse on themselves. And you could say God's judgment would, would come. So this is, a, 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 I mean, there's so much here that we could talk about. The thing that comes to mind is uh, don't be tempted by somebody that looks good. Too many people marry somebody. You say they look good. And they find themselves regretting that for the rest of their lives because, you know, they're a Christian and we're not supposed to be unequally yoked with non-Christians, but that's exactly what happened. These men, they were, you know, they had been fighting, they were tired, their wives were still, you know, several miles away, they hadn't seen their wives, and then these women come out here and dance before them, and, and so fornication takes place, and spiritually speaking, there's, there's uh, exactly the same thing happening we could talk about, you know, 24,000 died from this event. God brought judgment, a plague, and 24,000 Israelites died because they cursed themselves. So this is, again, the doctrine of, of Balaam. So the church of Pergamos did the same thing, and Jesus hated it. And Jesus, uh, they, they were mixing paganism with Christianity, false doctrine, whoring after false gods. Um, again, uh, Pergamos was the place of Caesar worship, but this is where paganism began to creep into the church, and it's been happening ever since. Almost 2,000 years ago this happened, and it's still in churches today. Um, again, where people make um, false gods, or government is their god, um, spiritual idolatry. You know, you don't in the false churches, you won't hear of, of repentance. You won't hear of talking about sin or repentance or making Jesus Lord of your life. It's just uh, kind of do what you want and, and feel good about yourselves. And it's just kind of a big pep talk. And, and they never bring out scriptures that bring correction like we see here in this, in this book. So there's a lowering of their standards of holiness. There's, again, mixing... Um, the things of the world, like homosexuality, in with the churches, compromise. Today I see it in a, what's called a message of grace, 
It ain't grace, but they call it grace, where basically you can do what you want, and it doesn't matter. You know, your, your sins are washed away, so now you can do whatever you want. You know, they call that grace. That's in the churches today, and it's, it's deadly. It is so deadly. Again, Jesus is watching your works. You will be judged for your works. Your works determine what's really in your heart. And so this is a deadly doctrine. The Bible talks about apostasy in the last days, and we'll get to that when we get to Laodicean church. But paganism in the church, horoscopes. I can't, I can't understand how Christians think horoscopes are okay or tarot cards or, or playing around with stuff like that. That's paganism. Mixture. You can't mix it. So, they committed fornication. Verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, all right? So we've been talking about the doctrine of Balaam. Now we're talking about a different one. Now we're talking about the Nicolaitans doctrine. We've already talked about the first, that one in the first letter to the Ephesians. If you remember the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, um, it, it's those that are dominating the laity, uh, the, the people that are in positions of authority in the church, Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop, overseer, whatever they want to be, whatever they are, are, are dominating the laity, crushing the laity, is what uh, most theologian, theologians believe the doctrine of, of the Nicolaitans is. But it's interesting here, they have the doctrine of the, uh, of the Nicolaitans. The doctrine, back in Ephesians, it was the deeds of the Nicolaitans. It, it, was, it was just deeds. It was just deeds. But now... Those who did the deeds were put into a position of power in the church. And so now it became a doctrine that spread throughout the church, this doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And again, so you have them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He doesn't hate the people. He hated the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I hate, repent. That's Jesus. He tells us to repent. Some people don't believe you need to repent. Oh, you know, to get saved, you don't need to repent. You ever hear that one? Yeah. Crazy. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus himself will come with his judgment and eventually wrath. He's coming himself to deal with these people. Okay? We're talking about false doctrines in the church. Jesus is coming. He'll make all things right. Verse 17, the next verse, it says, He that has an ear, again, we've heard this already, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Again, you have to apply this to yourself. He that has an ear. To him that overcomes, this is a, a new phrase, to him that overcomes, will I give. And he talks about three things here that he's going to give. And I like this. Three things that he's going to give to who, who overcomes those that have faith. You get three things that he mentions. We already talked about a crown of life for the persecuted church. But then the hidden manna, one. Number two, a white stone. Number three, a new name written that which no man knows, saving he that receives it. All right, so what are these things? Well, the hidden manna, it really... Um, refers back to, you know, Israel had manna that fell from heaven, if you remember. They were going through the, the, the wilderness. And so Aaron took some of that manna and put it and hid it in the Ark of the Covenant. He put it in there with, under the mercy seat. So it was hidden. Um, and so that's kind of a, a representation of, of, of this phrase. But what that's really talking about is we know that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the... the actual, the true manna that came down from heaven. And so we will get a revelation of who Jesus really is. We will truly know him, know his ways, know his word. This is one of the promises of something where our eyes will be open and we'll see things clearly. Right now, we don't see all things clearly. The Bible says that in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. We see through a mirror darkly. But one day we're going to see him, see him as he is. 
then it says the Bible, Bible says we'll be like him when we see him as he is when he comes. And so that is the hidden manna. The world cannot see him. The world cannot understand this, this book. This is a spiritual book. But when he comes, he will give reward to his servants and the prophets. That's us. We're his servants and his prophets. And we will see him and know him. Second thing he rewards is a white stone. In ancient days, when they would have a, a court, uh, if, you're, if you're like on the jury, basically you'd kind of be given a, a white stone and a black stone. The white stone means I say that they're innocent. The black stone says I say they're guilty. You, you throw in your stone, the white one or the black one. And so the white stone represents innocence, and we will be innocent before God in the courts of heaven because of the blood. A white stone was also a reward given to anyone that was victorious in the games. But here's the, the final and I think the most important application of the white stone. 1 Peter 2, 3 talks about we are stones. We are stones. We are the stones that, he, that this represents. It says in 1 Peter 2, 3, If so be you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone. Jesus was the cornerstone. He was the living stone. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. And precious, but you also, as lively stones or living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So this white stone represents you. And then he says he's going to place this name. So uh, the white stone means you're innocent. It means you're victorious. And that you are built up as the house of God for all of eternity. And then he says he will give you a new name that will be placed on the stone. And so the new name really describes, and it, it's only for you, it's only because it's what God did in you. It's unique to you and your relationship with God. Hallelujah. What he did for you and in you and with you. He made you a whole new creation. You'll be a new living stone in the house of God. It'll perfectly reflect the work of God that he did in your life. And so this stone represents you and you will be given a new name that no one else knows between you and him. And he owns you. That's, when he names you, that means he owns you. He is yours. You are his. Hallelujah. And so I think that's the last one before we get into the next church. Yep. All right. So I went, got through two churches, Smyrna and Pergamos. Next time we'll talk about Thyatira, and we'll stop there. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's just give Pastor a hand praise just for his obedience to God and bringing the word to us. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that new name because God has done some things for me that's been between me and him and uh, I'm looking forward to that new name on that white stone. Uh, do thank you so much for being out. Uh, please remember to give your offering, uh, all the ways to do it. You can do it in the back or on the kiosk and you can do it online as well. And if you'll stand with me, we'll just pray and be dismissed. Father, once again, we thank you for bringing us here today. We all came out just for you, Lord, for you to speak to our hearts. We're hungry and we are desperate for you, Lord. You are our only hope. And we thank you so much for opening our hearts to receive your word. Allow it to stick with us through the rest of the week and let it meditate upon our hearts. And we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.